Well, we're continuing our exploration of the book of Genesis. We spent the first eight sessions going through what some people would call the creation week, the first seven days, chapters one and two. We're still in what many people would call unit one. The first 11 chapters are distinctive in a sense. But we're in session nine, and we're going to be focusing on chapter three, what some people would call the seed plot of the entire Bible. And uh, the, one of the main things, a lot of people would regard chapter 3 as the most important chapter in the Bible simply because it is the foundational uh, chapter for virtually every doctrine in the Bible. They all have their roots, if you will, in what is called the predicament of man. Man has got a predicament that derives from the events of chapter 3. And God's program from cover to cover is God's uh, uh, mechanism to extricate man from this predicament that he's gotten himself into. So we talked about the creation chapters 1 and 2. We're now in chapter 3, the fall of man. And uh, now you may recall, just to give you set the stage from last time, as we close chapter 2, we found Adam created. He gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, it was not found a help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. He took one of his ribs, or from his side in any case, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a uh, woman and brought uh, her unto the man. And... Uh, and Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And uh, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. That phrase, of course, is quoted at least two or three times by the Lord himself, and, and uh, it's a, a foundational um, uh, aspect to the whole biblical perspective. And we did discuss, this is all by way of review from last time. And they were both uncovered. The word naked is the way it's translated in the King James. And all of us are victims of our little Sunday school coloring books, and we visualize these two nude people hiding among the leaves. Well, it may be much more profound than that. They were sinless. They may have been clothed with light. You can't prove that they were lived in only three dimensions. They may have been, they're, they're, the concept of everything we know about uh, the creation itself, and Adam in particular, we know post-curse. We, have, we can only guess what it was like beforehand. So uh, they were both uncovered or uh, naked, and the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Now this is where marriage is instituted, of course, and Christ based his teaching on this passage in, Mark 19, in Matthew 19 and Mark 10, and, and we talked about it last time. He, in fact, quotes this passage uh, in both the chapter 1 and chapter 2 aspects. One wife, not multiples. Matthew 9, verse 8 emphasized that. It's heterosexual. and not, It wasn't Adam and Steve. It was Adam and Eve, right? And uh, it's also intended to be permanent. God's intention was that it to be permanent. And it's very clear, as Paul emphasizes in 1 Corinthians 11 and 1 Timothy 2, that the man is the head of this union. And we're going to touch upon some of the implications of that in, as we get into chapter 3. But um, that's clearly the biblical model. And uh, so, in chapter 3, we're going to encounter the Nachash, the shining one. And we're, uh, we later became, you becomes the serpent. That word means serpent later. Um, the forbidden fruit. It wasn't an apple, as is often joked. It's a, and uh, we are going to study carefully the methodology that Satan uses to disrupt things here. He first creates doubt. Yea, hath God said. And then just direct denial. Ye shall not surely die. Direct contradiction with God. And from this, of course, we have God's declaration of war, the so-called invisible war, that you and I are both the pawns in and the prize. We need to understand this war that's been going on since Genesis chapter 3. And it has, involves two seeds, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. So let's just jump in. And uh, uh, one of the first things I would like to emphasize before we even get into the text Let's be careful that we really understand that this is not an allegory. This is not some useful fable. This is not a parable. In the scripture, there often are parables, but in the parables, the people don't have names. No, this is intended. 
by God himself to be understood as history of real people and real issues. And uh, so uh, let's, just, let's, let's dismiss the tendency in literature to treat this allegorically. And uh, the first word, well, the, let's read the first verse. That, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God hath made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So the first, we have this word nachash, which actually means the shining one. And uh, in the Hebrew, it comes from a Hebrew root, which uh, is, the same, is the same root that drives the word hiss, mutter, uh, whisper, enchanter. And so it's, uh, it, it, uh, it, it, uh, if I was translating this, I'd call, I'd call him the shining one. The Chaldean, it's also similar to a Chaldean root, which means bright, like brass or copper and so forth. And it's also the root from which we get the seraphim, the burning ones, the bright ones, so forth. So it's the nachash, the shining one. Now, it's, all, it's strictly a matter of conjecture as to how uh, Satan uh, addressed the woman. Did he, did he, did he indwell some animal or what, what was really going on here? We're not sure. We do know that as a result of his shenanigans, the serpent was cursed and the word comes to mean serpent later. But we, that's conjecture on our part. The serpent was more subtle than any um, uh, beast of the field. Now, the word subtle we often use in a negative sense, but the word means wise, full of wisdom. It's even used as prudent. It's used as uh, full of wisdom in Ezekiel uh, 28, where we have Satan's origin described. And he was full of wisdom in the positive sense. The sense uh, uh, and also uh, the, word, the same word used, prudent, in uh, Proverbs, uh, uh, all through four or five places in the book of Proverbs. So the word, so th th this creature was wiser than any beast of the field. And the word beast there is a strange word. It, uh, it really is, uh, means, means living being. Um, but in any case, he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So the first thing he's going to do is introduce doubt. We can study this passage for weeks. They try to extract the many, many lessons that lay uh, intrinsic uh, to this uh, passage. But obviously, uh, one of the things we discover is Satan's first step is to get us to doubt what God said. That's exactly what he did with Eve, and that's exactly what he does today in our schools, yes, even in our churches. Yea, hath God said? Did he really say that? Was that really what he meant? First step is doubt, introduce doubt. And, of course, the woman responds. She said, the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Do you notice something strange about what she said? She adds something to it. God didn't say anything about not touching it, apparently. And uh, so the first thing she does then as response to this doubt is to embroider, amend, modify what God said. Subtly, but uh, in, in ways that uh, uh, are injurious. It's interesting to notice how the Bible has those injunctions, especially in the book of Revelation. There's several others in the Bible, but the one of the most conspicuous is the book of Revelation. Anyone that adds anything to this book will have added him the, of the plagues that are written in this book. <laughs> you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. Um, anyone that takes away will be takes away the blessing. In other words, it's, it's a, a clear injunction. So... Um, the serpent said to the woman, now notice, he set up the doubt. He's got her amending what God actually said. And uh, the serpent said to the woman, ye shall not surely die. He's now at a point in the relationship to, in, to employ a direct contradiction with what God said. And that's obviously what we see prevalent in our society. You know, one of the great tragedies of the society we live in is the biblical illiteracy. You know, even in our early years of this country, they may not have been believers, but they at least knew their Bible. You, could have, you had a basis for communication. Uh, today, it's astonishing to find people in office, people that are uh, wearing judges' robes that are so spiritually bankrupt and so biologically unlearned that they, regard, they don't understand that, that uh, homosexuality is unnatural and uh, so on. So, uh, but in any case, um, but, but, so here's Satan directly 
contradicting what God said. Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Boy, you could, we could spend a whole hour's lecture just summarizing the false cults, the various pagan uh, belief systems that are built on the idea of becoming like gods. There are prominent denominations that masquerade as Christian denominations that merchandise the idea that if you follow their program, you're going to be like gods. And uh, uh, I, won't, I don't want to dwell on that here. I'm not going to get into an anti-cult motif here except to be sensitive to the fact that, that uh, every uh, uh, pseudo-Christian cult finds a way to deny the deity of Christ. And, uh, but God doth know that they and ye there, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So he's, he's uh, luring Eve to violate God's commandment. And, uh, and uh, so, second step. First step, create doubt. Second step, denial. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant uh, or desirable uh, to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. Boy, those are, the th those are three basic lures, isn't it? The tree was good for food, appealing to the appetite. It was pleasing to the eyes. You know, it's interesting. I actually, I can remember many years ago reading a, quite an essay by a, a, a biblical scholar that was arguing that the portal that Satan uses is the eyes. The portal that God uses is the ear. It's, and I was quite, a, at first, this is, you know, you, I, I see a lot of these kinds of things. I take them with a grain of salt usually, but I was quite intrigued with the, 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 the number of scriptures. God, so then faith cometh by hearing, right? Uh, in the seven letters, seven churches, he that hath an ear, let him hear, and so forth. And it's interesting, as you go through Scripture, you'll notice that the eyes tend to be the mechanism by which we stumble. Whether it's uh, David looking over a balcony seeing Bathsheba or whatever. You can go through it. it, it, it the, our eyes get us into trouble. And uh, anyway, uh, uh, that was pleasant to the eyes. And a tree desired to make one wise. How many people stumble in their pursuit of knowledge and wisdom. Not that knowledge and wisdom is bad, don't misunderstand me, but that pursuit can become an obsession. That pursuit without God can create, lead into an arrogance and an insularity that can be disastrous. And uh, it's, it's, it, you see that in the Christian field. It's astonishing to me to see people with the fancy degrees after their name that make their living posing as Christian experts that have no concept of what the Bible says, have no concept of Christ and who he was and his atonement and the rest of it. I can understand somebody rejecting all that. That's their choice. But I, I, it puzzles me why people would make a career of that world and deny its essence. doesn't make sense. So like a doctor that uh, uh, becomes a doctor knowing that he, he can't heal anybody or whatever. I, I, poor examples, I guess. But anyway, so these are the three things. The appetite, good for food, pleasant to the eyes, or pursuit of beauty, you might say, and a tree desired to make one wise. When she saw these three things, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now, for some reason, it's been traditional to visualize this as some kind of apple or fruit. It really doesn't matter what it was because its distinctiveness was that it was prohibited. And by violating this rule, they would discover they would, they would have knowledge of good and evil in the experiential sense. And that's the disaster. And uh, it's just beginning. Let's move on. Oh, well, a couple other things. Notice that she's the one that took the initiative. And this last little phrase, and also gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. One of the mysteries about this uh, incident is where was Adam when Satan was approaching Eve? You get the impression that if he had been there, there was a chain of command issue that somehow wasn't operative here. So the impression that we get from the narrative is that she took and she committed it, 
And then he comes and, 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 and joins her, obviously, in, in taking it. And we're going to talk about that in more depth here in a minute. But as we go into this, before we get into more of the verses, let's understand that there's far more uh, to learn here than just the simple fact because when we get to Romans chapter 5, verse 14, Paul makes an interesting remark that we really want to understand. He says, he's speaking there, he says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is a figure of him who was to come. Now, I'm not going to get into Paul's argument here, but incidental to making his argument, he speaks of Adam and his sin, and he says he is a figure of him who was to come. Who was the one that's coming? Jesus Christ. So, in fact, we have one of the titles of Jesus Christ in other passages. He is the last Adam. Okay? Adam was the first Adam. Christ, in some sense, was the last, the final. So Christ is going to, in his way, his commitment, his mission, is to undo the disaster that Adam brought on the human race. And again, I want to emphasize the crucifixion of Christ is not, an, not a tragedy. It's an achievement. It's the climax of, of, of all kinds of preparations for thousands of years that God engineered. So let's talk about this a little bit. Let's shift gears here a little bit. One of the things we're going to talk about is this whole concept of the marriage. And let's just jump into this. Now, you girls, just bear with me. I'm sure that if you have a biblically literate husband, you've had Ephesians 5.22 crammed down your throat more than once, okay? So just bear with me for a minute because Paul, in his letter to Ephesians chapter 5, says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. I won't ask for a show of hands, girls, but I'm sure you've had that pointed out to you by uh, one or more fellas. Um, and I'm going to suggest to you that while on the one hand this has a very direct practical application, and it also sets a chain of command we're going to talk about, there's far more under, behind the surface here than it would appear at first, because when you, if, if the if first few verses bother your girls, just read on to the next few verses. Verse 25, Hong, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So what Paul is portraying here, the concept, the concept of the marriage is the wife is to be subject to the husband. Fine, we understand that. But look at the other side of the coin. Husbands, you need to love your wives as Christ loved the church. Okay? Now you say, gee, okay, I can understand that. We could spend time on this in terms of guidelines for the marriage. But just about, and, and, and he goes on a little bit. He says, so men... Uh, uh, so, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. No man has ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth even as the Lord the church. There's again this one flesh idea. For we are members of his body and flesh of his, uh, and, uh, of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause, here's this quote again from Ge uh, Genesis uh, 2. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. Now if you've been reading in Ephesians from verse 22... To, uh, to 30 here, you get the impression of what Paul is dealing with is some practical counsel, biblically rooted counsel for the husband and wife to get along and to operate their marriage. Just about the time you think you understand what he's driving at, he throws you a zinger. He flips the whole thing over in the next verse. This is a great mystery. A mystery, by the way, is the word mysterion in the Greek is used differently than we think of a mystery. A mystery, a mysterion in the Greek, is something that's been hidden up till now, but I'm revealing it to you. It's, it's as if I'm disclosing to you a password. That's the, that's the concept. This is a great mystery, for I speak concerning Christ and the church. In other words, what Paul is really saying is that 
He first highlights the ideal model of a marriage, but he's doing that because the marriage has been instituted for us to understand something far more profound than just the marriage, Christ and his church. And this leads then to a discussion a little bit further about marriage. We generally talk about marriage in, in at least four different ways. We speak of it, of course, as a biological basis uh, in terms of procreation. That's pretty obvious in a biological sense. We speak of marriage in a psychological basis. The idea that two people join together to face life's challenges and, and it, its joys and its sorrows and so forth. We, we visualize it, um, uh, young, uh, they often say, um, uh, uh, a woman is a young man's mistress, a middle-aged man's companion, and an old man's nurse. But, <laughs> so there's certain phases of psychologically in the various phases of marriage. A third way is the sociological basis of marriage. The marriage is the basic molecule of, of, of the community, of the tribe, of the nation. And uh, it's interesting that the, how the world and Satan as the, as the prince of that world directly is attacking the concept of marriage in order to unravel society. It's astonishing to me to see how many people in political pursuits are unabashedly committing themselves to undoing the basic core molecule of our society, the marriage. And, uh, and of course, there's a fourth thing, that's why I'm lazy, lazy, there's a, there's a, a separate from biological or psychological or sociological issues, there is a supernatural issue of the marriage, a spiritual basis of the marriage and that is often overlooked. And that is really what Paul is driving at in the book of Ephesians. And, and uh, much of what you'll find in the New Testament epistles will escape you unless you understand that God has ordained the marriage not just for procreation, not just to help us uh, 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 feel our, our, our challenges as, as, uh, of life, not just for sociological concerns, but as a mechanism to communicate to us something far deeper that's not communicated any other way. And I'm going to call it the spiritual or prophetic aspects of marriage. We saw that in, in the, we're going to see that in detail when we get to Genesis 22 and 23 and 24. Genesis 22, the Abram's uh, uh, offering of Isaac. And I don't, I, I'll, I'll forego my uh, desire to sort of get into that here because it's such a fabulous thing, but we're going to spend a specific time on that later on in our studies. But uh, following that, even the issue of Isaac and Rebekah, and we're going to be astounded at how the Holy Spirit has even diddled with the record, edited the record, so that it fits some broader models. But perhaps the most uh, uh, romantic one is the, the, the narrative Ruth and Boaz in Ruth, a little four-chapter book where Boaz, of course, is in the role he introduces us to the concept of a kinsman redeemer, the goel, if you will, through which several things occur, one of which is that the, the land is redeemed back to Naomi, uh, who is a model of Israel in a sense, and he takes on a Gentile bride, a Moabitess, in fact, which was prohibited by the law if it was, if it was a guy. Uh, but, uh, but what the law could not do, grace abounds. So, and we, uh, again, I'll resist the temptation to... If you're, this is probably familiar to you. If not, you really want to get into a study of the book of Ruth. It's uh, very rewarding. The whole concept of Jehovah or Yahweh or however you want to pronounce it and Israel as uh, Israel is portrayed as the wife of, uh, of uh, God and his, with his covenant name, Yahweh. And uh, Hosea, the whole book of Hosea is, is an exemplar of that. There are other places the same idiom is used. But of course the climactic one in a marriage sense is the church as the bride of Christ. Those idioms are, of course, in Isaiah, 2 Corinthians 11, Revelation, several places, and so on. Now, it's fascinating to me that you can go through the whole Bible and discover that there are Gentile brides all through it. Adam and Eve. I'll start with them, okay? I'll say she's not, they're not Jewish, they're before Abraham. Uh, Isaac and Rebekah. And, uh, Joseph and Asenath, when Joseph went down to Egypt, he took an Egyptian bride. And, and uh, Moses and Zipporah, he had a Gentile bride. And Solomon and Rahab, remember the, uh, Rahab at Jericho, that's that. And it's their son, that's name is Boaz, and Boaz has a Gentile bride called Ruth. Now, in each one of these narratives, 
you can take them as a topical study and discover that not only are there certain historical things that happen, but from those you can infer lessons that are spiritual. And again, I'll forego the occasion to go through each one of those as examples, but I'll tell you just one subtlety that fascinates me. In each one of these Gentile brides, you'll discover that there's no death recorded. Now, uh, if, you take, if, if, if you take as, uh, as, 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 as a literal a view as I do of the scripture, you discover that nothing's there by accident. Not only things that are there, but the things that are not there. And we'll talk about that when we get to Genesis 22 as just one example. I had a lot of fun with verse 19 there. Um, often what is not mentioned is often just as significant as what is mentioned. It fascinates Now, obviously, don't misunderstand me. These people, I'm sure, did die. Don't, I'm not trying to pre create something you know, mystical in that sense. But it's interesting to me, and I think provocative, that they uh, are, there's no death recorded. There's a number of these kinds of observations that are very dear to me. That's one of them. Another one is, do you know that when, after Christ's crucifixion, he was never seen except with loving eyes? And he was never handled but by loving hands. Now you say, gee, check, there's six. Why isn't there seven? Who can tell me who the seventh one is? Oh, come on. Okay. The church. There you go. Right on. Now, there's another issue here. Paul gives us another insight from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Yes, Eve was deceived, but what, what Paul tells us Adam knew what he was doing. Now, this brings a whole another insight. I want you to imagine, guys, that you're Adam. You have not sinned. You're clothed with light. You walk with God. I mean, it's your, you've got it made, right? You come home, and you discover that Eve has really blown it. The conversation would go something like this probably. Boy, kid, you're in big trouble. Now, I'm still okay, you know. But you, kid, you, 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 you've really done it this time. And I'll tell you, I'll pray for you, you know. <laughs> you know. You get the, get, get, see what I'm saying? Paul tells us that Adam knew what he was doing. And I'm going to suggest to you something that's really disturbing as you think it through. Adam loved her so much that he chose to join her in her predicament rather than to go on without her. Whatever destiny was brought upon her head by this sin, he willingly, knowingly, not through deception, joined her. He became sin for her. Because he did, there was offspring and a mechanism that God would use to redeem mankind. Now the first question is, guys, and you don't need to raise your hands on this one, do you love your wife that much? Would you be willing to exchange your eternity for her welfare? Adam really loved Eve. And I think the point here is that's how much Christ loved his church. You, you, you see, do you see where this is going? Do you see where this is going? See, he was, Adam was a figure of one who would come and knowingly, who was innocent and sinless, knowingly, willingly, take her place. Take her place. Adam's a type of Christ. Adam, by the way, was a son of God. You and I are not in the natural. Luke, in his genealogy, can say Adam was a son of God. Son of God, the word, in the, if the, uh, the word in the scripture means a direct creation of God. Angels were uh, bar Elohim, direct creations of God. The book of Job, four times, speaks of the, the, the sons of God, meaning angels, because they were directly created by God himself. 
Adam was directly created by God himself. You and I were not. We're descendants of Adam. We're sons of men, not God. And that's, you, it, you won't, unless you understand that, you won't appreciate how John's gospel opens. When you get down to verse 11 of chapter 1, it's speaking of Christ. It says, he came unto his own, but his own received him not. But as many as received him to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. That's why in chapter 3 it's called the new birth. It's a new birth. If you're in Christ, you've had two births. You've got a natural birth, obviously. You also have a spiritual birth. A spiritual birth. Sometimes it's very dramatic. Sometimes it actually gets revealed incrementally over years. But you are a new, cre you are a new creation in Christ. And that's uh, all through the scripture. So Adam, anyway, was the son of God. Adam was not deceived. We've just gone through that. Romans points out that he was a figure of him to come. Adam is a type or a foreshadowing or what we say in our, our vocabulary, typically a model, and a, a, pro, a, a type. And we use the term prototype. He was the means of salvation for Eve. Had he not done, given himself, Eve was gone. But because he did that, there was offspring. See, no offspring until after the sin. That's interesting. In fact, 2 Corinthians 5.21, speaking of Jesus Christ, says he was made sin for us. Boy, you, 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 you uh, can't get into that until you get to, um, when you look at John 3. In fact, when, you go, when you're in Numbers 21, you, you encounter this weird mechanism God uses to heal these people that are bit by serpents. He tells, tells uh, uh, Moses to put a brass serpent on a pole, put it up on the hill. Everyone that looks at it will be healed. Now, if he wants to heal them, great, but that, that's a weird way to do things. And the more you think about that in the context of the Old Testament, it makes no sense. A serpent was a symbol of sin. What's that got to do with it? And brass? Well, brass was Levitical. It was the metal that could handle heat, so it was a, a symbol of fire. So it's a fiery serpent kind of idea. It makes no sense until you get the New Testament. Most of the Old Testament will make no sense unless you put the New Testament with it. It's full of unappeased longings, unfulfilled prophecies, unfulfilled uh, promises that meet the climax in the New Testament. It's one book. It's one book. And when we get to John 3, Jesus himself explains that. As the, Moses raised the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. And you suddenly begin to realize, whew, this has all been designed. God knew about John 3 before Numbers 21. You follow me? To put it in a funny way. Jesus was made sin for us. You and I have no grasp of what that really meant, what that means. We get a glimpse of it when we hear him on the cross. His opening words are, uh, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God forsaking his son. First time in eternity they were separated. It's the only time he didn't call him father. The only time he didn't call him father. Why? Because he couldn't. He's in our shoes. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Exclamation. He was made sin for us, just as Adam was made in sin in a sense for her. We also learn, we will learn before chapter 3 is over, it's going to take a kinsman to undo this. God can't just do it. It takes a kinsman of Adam to fulfill the law on his behalf, a kinsman redeemer. That's going to be required. It's only hinted at in Genesis 3, but the seeds are set there, and pun intended. Um, and when we get to Revelation chapter 5, for many, and I know as a teenager, I never really understood it until I got to Revelation 5. And there was a man, there was one sitting on the throne that had a book sealed, book sealed with seven seals. Who's worthy to open the book and loose the seals thereof? And I, John says, I sobbed convulsively because no man was, it had to be a kinsman. No man was found worthy to open the book. And he realize, we don't realize it. He realizes what, what a disaster that is. One of the elders says, wait, wait, don't, don't. There's, there's one. There's one. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book. I turned and looked and I saw the lamb as it had been slain. And you need to understand that. If you don't understand that, you won't understand chapter 4 when you get to Cain and Abel. But anyway, a kinsman's required. And we understand kinsmen when we get to Ruth and so forth. These are fundamental concepts all through the scripture. And of course, Adam's a type of Christ, just as the church is a, is a bride of Christ. And that's it amused all through the scripture. Well, let's go ahead. Let's pick up the text now. We've got six verses. We're doing pretty well. Okay, verse 7. Uh, 
So they sinned, and the eyes of them were opened, and they knew that they were uncovered and naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Boy. Well, we'll come back to that in a minute. Let's just get verse 8 here. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The word cool, by the way, is the word ruach in the Hebrew, which is the world, it's cool or like a breeze. The word ruach also means the spirit, by the way. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. How naive can they be? Hide from God? You've got to be kidding. But before I go any further, do you think God was surprised? There are several things God can't do. Did you know that? You're supposed to gasp in horror. God can do anything. No. No, uh-uh. God cannot lie. Eight times in the Tanakh it says the eternal one cannot lie. Something else he can't do, he can't learn. Because he knows everything. So he can't be surprised. We may use that rhetorically in an anthropomorphic sense, but no, God is not, he's never surprised. The Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And this is not the challenge of an arresting officer. It's the cry of a heartbroken father. Where art thou? You know, the tragedy of sin, there's many tragedies of sin, not the least of which that it multiplies, but the other tragedy of sin is it always separates you from God. If you're considering something and you're a little troubled as to which way to go about something, ask yourself, will doing X, whatever it might be, bring you closer to God or distance you from God? Because it'll do one or the other. Everything in your life will do one of two things. It'll draw you closer or distance you. If it's distancing you, it has sin at its root. Adam, where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was uncovered and I hid myself. You know, it's interesting. God always does the seeking. It's, we don't seek God. You have all these churches who are seeker churches. I won't go down that path. But the point is, no, God does the seeking. He did it with Adam, as we just see here. He saw it with Abraham. Abraham was an idol-worshiping Gentile that God called Abraham. Abraham didn't call God. God called Abraham, and he responded. Jacob, at Bethel, when he saw the ladder, was fleeing. He was on the lamb, terrified. Moses was a fugitive in Midian when the burning bush took place. Who's calling who? God's calling each. Remember, Jesus said the same thing. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. The shepherd always seeks the sheep. And he's seeking you right now. Every one of you in the chairs out there and everyone listening to the voice or watching this video or whatever is there by God's divine appointment. There are no accidents in God's kingdom. God has a purpose in this encounter. And your prayer and mine is that his purposes in your life would bear fruit, that, they would, that, that he would accomplish his purpose in each of us, whatever that might be. And uh, well, continuing verse 11, and he said, who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? The man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. That is the <laughs> silliest excuse that men have always used. It's her fault. <laughs> the woman that thou gavest me. God, it's your fault because you gave me this woman and you know, she gave me the tree and I did eat. As if that is explained. It's astonishing how people will not take responsibility for the decisions. The Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. See, it wasn't her. It was a serpent. It reminds me of Flip Wilson. There's a comic some years ago. He had a whole thing. He always said, the devil made me do it. You know, <laughs> He had a whole little routine that was uh, a form of humor, but uh, always blaming it uh, on Satan. I remember as a teenager, I saw a cartoon once. I think it was in Christianity Today or one of those magazines uh, I happened to see that showed uh, Satan was sitting on a curb crying. And the caption says, those Christians are blaming me for everything. <laughs> 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 but 
The great tragedy of the millennium is that Satan is bound, and after a thousand years of perfect rule, no want, full knowledge of the Lord, man still takes the first chance he gets to rebel. There's a lesson there. There's enough sin in our flesh to take care of. Uh, it doesn't need a lot of help from Satan. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. I often wonder what that really means. We think of it probably in a, in a uh, zoological sense, you know, snakes of the dust. But I, I can't help but always think of Michael fighting with Satan over the body of Moses. What does he want the body for? What does he care? Anyway, then we get to the declaration of war by God against Satan and his empire. He says, I will put enmity between thee, speaking to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. And from this verse, Genesis 3.15, we have the introduction of this strange title of the Messiah, the seed of the woman. It's a very strange phrase, both biologically as well as grammatically, because the seed is the man, not the woman. And, uh, but it's a hint of the virgin birth that, of course, gets confirmed in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. But many people who recognize this verse fail to notice that there's a second seed mentioned, the seed of the serpent. And all of history from this verse through the end of Revelation is a drama of this conflict between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And an interesting exercise for those of you who take your Bible seriously is to go through the Bible and do a panorama of this struggle. You, uh, of, of, you, you can look at the whole Bible as Satan's attempt to thwart the plan of God. And uh, now, Romans 5, verse 18 and 19, Paul says, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. All men, by the way. You're stuck with it. Even so, by righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto the justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Do you see? Again, the antiphony between Adam, the first Adam, and the last Adam, Christ. Let's continue this thing. For God has said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle among every beast of the field, and thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This starts a chain. I sometimes call it the, the scarlet thread. It starts here and climaxes at the cross. One could say it really climaxes in Revelation 22, fine, but my point is this is, this is uh, the chain. Uh, you can follow this right through. A, a, good, a good chain reference Bible or Schofield, whatever, will, will have this chain to follow through. It's a great way to, to do your studies. And uh, when did Israel begin? We talk about Israel all the time. When did Israel start? Well, you can argue that Israel started as the seed of a woman in Genesis 3.15. And I'll, I'm going to argue that John in Revelation looks at it that way because Eve will be the first, of the, uh, if you will, of the, the line of the woman. Some would say, well, the, Israel really began with the call of Abraham. He was the first Jew in that sense. And Genesis 12, we'll deal with that intensively when we get to chapter 12. And it, not only under Abraham, but through the tribe of Judah in Genesis 49, the royal tribe. And, but the birth of the nation Israel, you can argue that Israel started with any one of these, but it's, uh, it's uh, uh, more formally uh, seen as being born in Exodus 4. God himself speaks of the exodus from Egypt. Uh, they went down as a family, but they come out as a nation. The birth of the nation is in Exodus 4. And of course, many people would measure much from the dynasty of David, from 1 Samuel 7. And of course, reconfirmed by the virgin birth in Isaiah 7.14. There's a summary of this whole panorama in Revelation, chapter 12. Many people call Revelation 12 the toughest chapter in the book of Revelation. I don't think so. It's very straightforward, actually. Let's take a quick look at it. Romans, excuse me, Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder, or sign, if you will, in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. 
It's amazing to me how many people contrive the strangest things to try to identify who this woman is. And uh, some try to make it the church and so forth. And uh, it, uh, if it's the church, uh, it's got a big problem because she's pregnant. The church is always portrayed as the virgin bride of Christ. This, this woman is uh, pregnant with a child. But the other thing, fortunately, some people say, well, this, the, the, the 12 uh, stars refer to the zodiac. People who say that are probably more correct than they have any idea if they really understand the Matzeroth, the Hebrew zodiac, which, of course, deals with the 12 tribes. We've talked about that in the earlier sessions. Our identity of who this woman is, is is given to us by none other than Israel or Jacob himself. And uh, in fact, uh, the uh, if you look at uh, Genesis 37, you may recall Joseph had these dreams. You remember the different dreams he had? He'd tell his brothers. Brothers were underwhelmed with his dreams. But he finally has uh, he has this one where he talks about his, he dreamed that there were, there were these 12 stars and he was one of them. And even the sun and the moon bowed down to him. And his dad, at this point, has had it. He says, you mean your mother and I are going to bow down to you? He understood that what was portrayed in the imagery there was Israel in terms of 12, the 12 patriarchs. And the sun and the moon were taken to be Jacob and his wife. You follow me? That's Jacob's own interpretation in Genesis 37. In any case, this woman here is the seed of the woman extended, of course, to, through this child, being with child, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, another sign in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon. And we know who that is because in verse 9 he's identified for you, Satan, of course. Great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and, upon, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven. And here the term is used to be, to, to be angels, we believe. And did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for, to devour her child as soon as it was born. We'll talk about how Satan tried to do that more than once. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Who is that? Who is the man-child? Jesus Christ. He's identified as ruling with the nations with a rod of iron, Psalm 110, a whole bunch of places. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Most of us, when we see that, we do understand that the man-child is Christ. Well, if the man-child is Christ, the church didn't birth Christ. Israel did. You follow me? The woman is Israel. And uh, when we see this verse here in verse 5, that he's caught up to God and to his throne, we visualize the ascension. And it's probably correct. But I think it was G.H. Pember, uh, an ancient writer, that first recognized the possibility that this also includes the church. Because it's, we are the body of Christ. And when the body of Christ is caught up to God and his throne. And it's interesting that between chapter five, verse, five, verse 5 and verse 6, there's a whole era and if you're making charts and so forth, it's the church era because you ne when you get to verse 6 here, you're suddenly in the tribulation period. The woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. That's again the, recognized as the 12, you know, half of the seven-year period that Daniel talks about. But I don't know if we get in the prophecies thing here. I, mean, I just want to give you a quick summary. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. A guy by the name of Cook did a famous book called Between Christ and Satan. And the book was great. The title was terrible because it gives you the impression that Christ and Satan are the oppo opposers here. No, 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 no. Michael and Satan, they're both angels. Christ created them both. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. And he was cast out in the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And it goes on, of course. We won't take all the time here, but take just a little bit. He had a heard loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. And that's, of course, what Satan means. Is the word means accuser. Well, we see we really have summarized in Revelation 12 the battle of these two seeds. We know that the seed of the woman will be, the redemption is going to come through the human race. And that's going to be important as we look at Cain and Abel in the next chapter. And we also see in chapter 6 how the fallen angels tried to corrupt the humankind, the human genome, with these strange goings on. We'll talk about that when we get there. As God progressively reveals the details of his plan, he points out it's going to come through Abraham. And Abraham is singled out for special uh, attacks by Satan. And as God says, it's not only, going to, not only from Abraham's descendants, but it's going to be through Isaac and Jacob and, in fact, through David. When that happens, the line of David is singled out. Let's take a look at some of this. Corruption of Adam's line, we've talked about Adam's seed. 
uh, excuse me, Abraham's seed in Genesis 12 and 20 is dealt with. The famine in Genesis 50 are all Satan's attempts. The destruction of the male line in Exodus when Pharaoh kills all the Jewish babies is, is Satan's attempt to try to... The attempt to wipe out the Jewish remnant started way back then is going on today. There are Muslim groups, conclaves in major cities making lists of the Jews in that city. So when the order comes out, the Quran calls for them to kill every Jew. And also every Christian, by the way, in that order. So it's, it's Satan's attack from the... All prejudice and bigotry is wrong. But anti-Semitism has a particular supernatural aspect to it. It's part of Satan's agenda. Pharaoh's pursuit, even after he let them go, to go after him, led, of course, to the, the, the situation in the crossing the Red Sea. All part of Satan's attempt to wipe out the Jewish race. When God tells Abraham that after 400 years his descendants, his descendants can return to Canaan, that sets up a situation where Satan has 400 years to lay down a minefield of these strange tribes that God tells Joshua to wipe out every man, woman, and child of. Again, it's a genetic issue going on here. And of course, when God gets to the point where he, it's all going to come through David for 2 Samuel 7, now Satan can fo that allows Satan to focus his attack. Joram kills all the brothers in 2 Chronicles 21, but of course one is saved. The, Ab the uh, Arabians killed all, but uh, Hazariah, one slips away. Athaliah kills all, but Joaz, the infant, is hidden. Always there's an it's a servant that hides one of the children. The attempts again and again to wipe out the royal line. Hezekiah is a solid and so forth, Isaiah 36 and 38. Haman, you get to the Persian Empire. Haman was doing exactly what Hitler was trying to do, to wipe out every Jew in the empire. It was a world empire at the time, the Persian Empire, and Haman was after that as a goal. And uh, on it goes. So if we get to the New Testament, same thing. Joseph and his fear for Mary. He's afraid because of Deuteronomy 24. He was fear fearful of her, but God, of course, intervenes there. Herod's attempts to wipe out all the babies in Bethlehem. We celebrate that every Christmas. It's part of Satan's attempt to wipe out God's program. When Jesus is ministering at Nazareth, they try to throw him off a cliff. There are two different occasions that, where there's storms at the sea, and those storms I don't believe were natural storms. It's not that big a sea, by the way. And furthermore, the people involved were professional seamen that lived on that all their lives, and yet they were terrified. No, there's something else going on there. Those storms, I believe, were supernaturally inspired. And that's why Jesus brings peace by saying, rebuking the sea. Mark 4 and Luke 8. And of course, the ultimate stratagem was the cross, where Isaiah predicted he would be bruised for our iniquities, the very term that's used back there in Genesis 3. And the summary, of course, is in Revelation 12. We just looked at But he's not through, by the way. It's going on today. Look at the Islamic agenda. Look at the record of the United Nations. 60, 70 percent of the resolutions have to do with Israel, against Israel. Look at the European Union. Astonishing. Astonishing. Rising. And here in the United States, anti-Semitism is on the rise again. And part of the reason is because of the church. You go from Augustine's theology to Auschwitz, and it's going to happen again. So now God, let's pick it up in verse 16. The woman said, excuse, unto the woman God says, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy, in, in, in thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Notice that. He shall rule over thee. This idea of a chain of command was not unique to Paul. Paul was just amplifying what was the roots in the, in the Old Testament. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and also thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And he goes on. The thorns become a symbol of the cursed ground, and that's why it's so significant that they put a crown of thorns on the Messiah when he went to the cross to symbolize the curse that he was bearing. And that's fascinating to me because I'm sure those Roman soldiers were not Levitically trained. I'm sure they had no concept that they were fulfilling a prophecy in a sense. God can say, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it thou wast taken, and for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Bearing the curse, the ground was cursed, but it was made a curse. Uh, 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 Jesus was made a curse in Galatians 3.13. 
Man is to eat sorrow. The man of sorrows is the, one of the titles of Christ in Isaiah 53. Thorns and thistles infest the ground. Of course, the crown of thorns in John 18. The sweat of thy brow. And remember, he sweat as blood in, in Luke 22. So every one of these things have a tie-in. Dust to return, dust of death in Psalm 22, 15. Talking about the, 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 uh, the crucifixion in Psalm 22. A sword buried, awake with sword in Zechariah 13. Man is to die, and, and uh, why hast thou forsaken me from Psalm 22? And on it goes. Let's keep moving. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And Adam also and his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Verse 21, I don't believe is understood by 99 of 100 people that read this passage. But if you read the rest of the Bible and come back to this, you'll suddenly understand what God is really saying here. And you won't understand chapter 4, next session, unless you understand what God was doing here. God was discarding their, their attempts to cover themselves, these aprons of fig leaves, and he's made them coats of skins, which means these were animals. He was teaching them that by the shedding of blood, they would be covered. And it's not just a pragmatic clothing issue here. He's instituting the Levitical system. And you won't understand chapter 4 unless you understand that. And the more you read your Bible and come back to this, the more you'll see how it all ties together. And uh, only by innocent blood would they be covered. That's from Leviticus 17, verse 11, in effect. The fig leaves. What do we mean by fig leaves today? We obviously aren't making fig leaves. Oh, yes, we are. When we rely on our church going, religious exercises, ordinances, rules, do this, don't do this. Philanthropy, oh, we give a lot to these worthwhile. I'm not saying giving to the worthwhile things is bad. Don't misunderstand me. But if you're relying on that to please God, you've got a problem. Because that doesn't going to please God. That's, that's going to be as effective as the fig leaves that Adam and Eve tried. Altruism of any kind. Not that it's bad. Don't misunderstand me. What are you relying on? Are you relying on that for your program? Personal efforts of any kind. If they're intended to... Correct your relationship with God, you are blaspheming because Christ has done the whole job for you. That doesn't mean you don't do these things, but not for that reason. It's this or is the cross. Is it this or Gethsemane? Remember what Jesus did at Gethsemane. He prayed three times. Father, if there's any other way, let's take it. Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Three times. And that's what he was praying with such intensity that Luke, a doctor, says it was like sweats of your sweating blood. That wasn't a layman's thing. It was a doctor saying that. No, the, the, uh, the only way, to, only way to, cry, to, to God is through Christ on the cross. Those other things won't cut it for that purpose. They may be worth doing for other reasons, but that's not going to deal with your issue. Of you, God, you have to accept God's program. That's his program. We're talking about two trees here. Remember we had a, by the way, the cross is talked as a tree in Acts 5.30 and 1 Peter 2. They were both in a garden, Garden of Eden, and the, the, the cross was in a garden. That's why it's near the garden tomb. It's right there on the hill. Um, the curse was linked to a tree in Galatians 3, verse 13 and 17. You remember back in Genesis, we haven't got there yet, but you remember the story about the baker. He was hanged on a tree, Genesis 40, verse 19. When you get to Haman and Esther and all that, Haman ends up getting hanged. And by the way, it's a mistranslation. He wasn't hanged on a gallows. That's a King James corruption. He was crucified. Crucifixion was invented by the Persians, widely adopted by the Romans later. Haman int int intriguingly was crucified. Anyway, these trees, both trees are planted by God, one planted by God, one planted by man. They're pleasant to the eyes, but the one, other one has no beauty that we should desire, according to Isaiah. One was forbidden, one was commanded to eat. One Satan enticed, one Satan prevents. One brought sin and death, the other brought life and salvation. The, the two trees, the, the tree in the garden and the tree in, 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 in the cross. One turned out of paradise. In another case, the thief on the cross enters paradise that very day. Let's, let's wrap this up. And Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and did eat and live forever. He doesn't want man to live forever in his sinful state. The time will come when that is available to us when we've been redeemed. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man. He placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubim. Cherubim, the King James translated, cherubim itself is plural. You don't need this one there. But anyway. 
and a flaming sword which he turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. This is interesting. Why require a super angel? If you're trying to keep Adam and Eve out, a regular angel would be sufficient. One angel, you know, one night after dinner, slays 185,000 Syrian soldiers. You don't mess with angels. But we have cherubim here. These are the super guys. Why? To guard the way of the tree of life. From whom? From Adam? No, 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 no. That's the naive, you know, the flaming sword to keep Adam from coming back. No, that's, the, that's naive. No, it's to guard the way so it would be kept available to him when he's ready to, it's to guard the way of the tree of life. And the reason you have a cherubim, because you have a cherubim, you're fighting. How do you go after it? What do you go after a tank with? Another tank. What do you go after a submarine with? Not a destroyer. Another sub, right? What do you go after a, a, a fighter aircraft with? Another, you know, they are superiority fighter. You know, you go after like with like. That's just very typical. And uh, so what do you go after a cherubim with another cherub, right? So, um, Anyway, uh, and the cherubs are always guardians of God's majesty and glory. We see it all the way through the scripture. Now you can make your own list there. And Satan, of course, was the anointed cherub. He's the guy that was their boss at one time. Well, just a quick final wrap-up and review of what we talked before. We had all through our creation week the entropy, entropy profile of the universe. And, of course, the seventh one had no entropy change. But there's a gigantic event called the fall. And everything of history as we know it is subsequent to that fall. And the decline of entropy is part of that. And there's going to be a second decline of entropy in dramatic ways, and that's the flood when we get to chapter 6. But history, everything we know about history and the physical universe is post-curse. We can only guess what it was like before, and because all you and I are limited to seeing what has been already cursed, if you will. We've talked about the ten-dimensional ten universe and how it was perhaps shattered into what we call the physical universe, the four dimensions that we can directly experience, and the six hyperdimensions that we know are there but can only infer in, in, indirectly. And there's been articles just in the recent issue of Scientific American going into subtleties of all of this, and uh, the physical and what we call the spiritual universe, which is a, really a superset of, the, of uh, the whole. And the effects of fall. We think the entropy, there's some of us that believe that the entropy laws called the bondage of decay in Romans 8, were introduced as a result of, this, of the curse that God pronounces on the ground. We think the universe was fractured into its separate uh, physical and, and, and spiritual things. And redemption thus fall, revolves more than man alone. Because in Isaiah and Revelation, he says, I saw a new heavens and a new earth. So there's much more going on than just you and I, although we're the, we're the focus of it. And uh, remember when we were in Genesis chapter 2, uh, heavens, thus were the heavens and earth were finished and all the host of them, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God had created and made. And the rabbinical view, of course, of the creator caused a repose to encompass the universe. The laws as we know them were instituted or frozen, if you will, in a sense, then according to the rabbinical views like Nomonides and the rest of them. And for the laws of third and ninth, we talked about this. this is just by review from before to tie it together for you. The first law, conservation of matter and energy, we're familiar with. There's no way to win, in other words. In the seventh day, God ended his work. His works were finished. In other words, it has an end. There's no matter being created. There's no energy being created that isn't already there. All things that are therein, you preserve them all, Nehemiah says. The second law is the bondage of decay, the entropy laws, which means you can't even break even. There's always a loss of some kind. And... Uh, uh, thou shalt perish, but they shall perish and grow old as a garment. That's, that's in effect an expression of the entry law, Psalm 102. The earth will grow old like a garment. So it's, not, it's, it's been wound up, it's winding down. Heaven and earth will pass away, according to Matthew 24. Because the crea as Paul says in Romans, because the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God. So we see as from Romans 8 that part of the redemption will be a relief of the so-called laws of entropy and uh, the thermal decay thing, which we understand. Heat flows from cold bodies, hot bodies to cold bodies. The universe is not infinitely old, or it'd be, it, it'd be uniform temperature. It's not, therefore it's not old. So it had a beginning, and it means it will have an end. And we've talked about the Big Bang and all that. From This, all, this is sort of a tie together of all the, the, the uh, background that we laid down during the first eight sessions. But the central theme of all this is the Old Testament is the account of the nation. The New Testament is the account of a man, the last Adam. The Old Testament sets the stage for the appearance of the last Adam. The creator himself became a man. 
And his appearance is the central event of all history throughout the universe, not just here on the earth. And he died to purchase us, and he is alive today. Praise God. And our most exalted privilege is to know him, and that's what the Bible is really all about. And the scarlet thread begins from the seed of the woman, the call of Abraham, the tribe of Judah, the dynasty of David, the virgin birth, to another tree in another garden as we've gone through this whole thing. Now we're going to approach chapter 6 and the flood where there's another huge change, not just a lot of water. There's more things going on there then. And we're going to next time talk about Cain and Abel and also talk about chapter 5. We'll probably take them both in the next hour. So for next time, read chapter 4 carefully and read chapter 5 and see if you can find the hidden message that's tucked away in chapter 5. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we do praise you for who you are. We stagger as we attempt to comprehend the extremes that you have gone to on our behalf to make us eligible for a destiny we do not deserve and to spare us from the destiny that we do. We thank you, Father, for the gift of Jesus Christ. We thank you also, Father, for the gift of your Holy Spirit that has brought these things to our attention. But Father, we also pray that through that Holy Spirit, you'd open our hearts and lives to your word, that we might savor and digest that which you have for us in the bread of life that's before us. We do pray, Father, that you'd help each of us to grow and grace the knowledge of the seed of the woman, our Savior. As Father, we right now commit ourselves into your care, into your hands, without any reservation, submitting ourselves to his lordship. Help us, Father, to understand what all that means. Help us to know what you would have of each of us in the days that remain, that we might be more fruitful stewards of these incredible gifts you've given us as we do indeed commit all these things. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.